it was like a long time ago, nearly 30 years, and yet it feels like it was just yesterday. It was May 19, 1995, the film's opening day and my cousin and I were at the first showing after school. I had been anticipating the film for months, not for only for its swashbuckling sense adventure and its beautiful setting in the Scottish Highlands, but because I had been reading the history of this political movement. The people of Scotland had been fighting against the tyranny of England and for their independence as well as fighting amongst themselves for power. Now that I look back at it, I realize my fascination with this historical moment of political freedom might have had something to do with my own life situation. Not that my parents were tyrants or that I was at war with them, but as a 16-year-old I was consumed with pioneering my freedom and finding my own way in the world. Now, if you have not yet identified the name of the film, it is indeed Braveheart where Mel Gibson donned a kilt. And donned a kilt and a faux Scottish accent, painted his face blue, and aggressively charged around, challenging the English and Scottish lords alike. And even if you've never seen the movie, you're likely to remember the famous scene where, before the Battle of Stirling, where he inspired the troops to an inspiring, to a surprising victory. He comes out in the midst with the English hordes on the other side, and he's talking to his own Scots, and he says, I am William Wallace, and I see a whole army of my countrymen here in defiance of tyranny. You've come to fight as free men, and free men you are. What will you do with your freedom? We do without your freedom. And then facing some pushback from a heckler who says, we're not going to fight against that, forget it. He responds, I fight and you may die. Run and you'll live at least a while. In dying in your bed many years from now, would you be willing to trade all the days from this day to that for one chance? just one chance to tell our enemies that they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom, he yells out, of course. <laughs> My mind was taken back to the high drama of this film when I considered the nature of today's celebration of Palm Sunday slash Passion Sunday. For all the elements and intrigue in today's gospel, they belong on a big screen. But today was not the premiere of this story. You all are so familiar with it, this grotesque story, that it can be difficult to stay with it sometimes, to stay at an emotional level with all the details, all those gory details. Every year we're faced with the foundational question, the same one. Can Jesus' followers abide with the reality of the crucifixion? Can we abide with its human reality? Matthew's passion story brings out several unique emphasis, including that whole story around Judas and his suicide. And together, some of these features confront readers with the awful nature of Jesus' fate, and also with our reluctance to deal with it. And yet, Jesus abides with all of us. Jesus feeds all of us. Throughout the history of the Western Church, there's been a dark and lasting fascination with the brutality of the crucifixion. Stained glass windows have showed the story, as have crucifixes, especially during the high medieval and early Renaissance, when such violence mirrored the everyday lives of the people. And some folks still glory in the grim details of Jesus' suffering. Of course, the Gospels do not dwell on these points. They take for granted that the ancient audiences understood the brutality of flogging and crucifixion all too well. But some misguided folks sometimes seek to actively participate in the grisly details of it all, and perhaps watch a different film by Mel Gibson, The Passion of the Christ, which seeks to amplify what Jesus endured. Let me say this clearly. There is no good news in the degree of Jesus' suffering, nor is there any good news in our suffering. Anybody who makes it seem greater than it is or that it's for some purpose is probably trying to convince us not to embrace our own freedom. This 
idea is a distortion of God's benevolent grace that permeates life, that it's good and very good. And it's the same dark fascination that co- continues to occupy the 24-7 news cycle. If it bleeds, it leads. Our brains are hardwired to pick up and focus on the negative and to hold us captive instead of us understanding what the world is really like. And so while my personal focus on Jesus' narrative and his life rests with his incarnation and his teaching, I don't think we can skip over the gravity of the crucifixion as it shows the lengths to which he's willing to go to restore our freedom. It is the act, the very act, that opens the door to resurrection, to hope in the midst when hope seems lost. And while St. Matthew does not amplify the horror of the cross, this gospel does show us how it looks when Jesus' followers cannot endure witnessing it, in the way they cut and run. We see it first in Judas, who betrays him, then in the disciples at Gethsemane, who can't seem to stay awake. We see it also in that anonymous disciple who draws a sword at his arrest. And through his impulsive, short-lived courage, this act of violence also demonstrates an aversion to endure the arrest, suffering, and death. Again, Peter demonstrates three times as he denies and rejects him. And none of the male disciples can stand at the foot of the cross. They all flee, and only the female remain. Even Pilate himself distances by washing his hands of all of it. In all of these cases, we witness the way that Jesus follows fear, followers fear, witnessing what they've imagined to be the final act of their leader. And so they use their freedom to flee, to live for a while longer. And they trade their lives for their freedom. And they reject the true nature of life in the process. That life doesn't ever end. To return to William Wallace's quote, Palm Sunday and Passion Sunday are all about freedom. Sadly, too often, we tend to think of freedom as our own rights, as a freedom from the things we don't wish to endure. Whether it's tyranny of our parents or foreign powers, or the mundane tasks and chores that seem to constitute our lives, we demand relief. And we want someone else to pay the price for it. Sure, we'll follow for a while if it looks like we'll get what we want. We'll give you our vote, We'll be part of that political movement. But when things go sideways, when the rubber hits the road, we always flee. As Ron McIntyre shared last week, too often we pray that life's cup of, cup of suffering would pass us by, that we'd be whole and well. And in our wholeness and wellness, we'd get back to what we do best, complain about life. But that's not life. It's a lie. When we insist on freedom from suffering, we miss out on freedom's true nature. We miss out on life itself. Freedom's true nature is not freedom from, but rather freedom for. And that's what this gospel demonstrates. So Jesus embodies and empowers others to exemplify as well. Like Nelson Mandela, who once said, to be free is not merely to cast off one's chains but to live in a way that respects and embraces the freedom of others. Passion Sunday asks us to pause, to pause to witness an atrocity, that Jesus, God with us, humiliated, tortured, executed, and buried, to sit with that fact. But if we want to really appreciate what it means, We have to do that to understand that God dwells with us in all of the glory and all of the horror of our human condition. And so we create time and space to sit with that story, to embrace our freedom, that Jesus stays with us, 
however uncomfortable that may seem and make us. Jesus invites us to take hold of our freedom. Not freedom from, but freedom for. He invites us to understand what life is really about, what our lives are about. Not to believe the lies or the 24-hour news cycle, not to be afraid any longer, but to live here and now, to be present to all of it, and to know that God is in the midst of it. In this Holy Week, we have the opportunity to walk along Christ, to actually show up and follow. In the midst of a week that seems to be all about death, we finally have the freedom to think about what life is. You're free, free to follow or free to run. The choice is yours. But God came so that we might have life and have it abundantly. And that doesn't mean we're never going to have difficulties or encounter bumpy roads. We will. What it means is that on the other side of those roads are true and lasting life. That the power of the resurrection is in our midst. That it is the very freedom that allows us to think about others to find our true meaning in life, to know that God created us for freedom, that God created us for love, and to be that for this world, and to say no to all the powers that exploit and destroy, the tyranny of the dark forces, and instead to walk in the light and to grab hold of what God calls us to. This morning you're free. Will you follow? The choice is yours. Amen.